yeah, welcome everybody and and uh, uh, do a little housekeeping here first. Uh, I want to make sure everybody has their mics muted. Um, of course, uh, video turned off, so it's not going to be distracting uh, during the presentation. And if you have any questions, um, uh, you can uh, either raise your hand and I will uh, I will call it out. Um, uh, that should be the best way to do it. So um, with that stated, uh, I will turn the session over to Major George. Thank you, and thank you everybody for attending. I also like to give some uh, credit to uh, Mark Sobel and Keith Breton because some of the material here came from them. Um, this is a real fun and uh, I think useful flight cleaning. The purpose is to practice emergency procedures that we don't usually get to practice. So we're not going to talk about some of the stuff that you might routinely practice for your form fire, for example. This is some of the other stuff that you don't get to usually practice, but that might still happen. This is our brief agenda and the flight clinic as a um, itself consists of the ground session, which is what you're attending right now. And thank you so much for making the time for to um, attend this presentation. Then find instructor pilot. We're going to talk more about that towards the end how, but find instructor pilot talk to them, talk to them in advance, like tell them what you want to achieve with your flight in this flight clinic. The syllabus is customizable. It has some items, but you don't have to do all of them. So you can pick and choose the ones that are more interesting to you or the ones you haven't done in a while. You can also throw in some other stuff, time permitting, um, like some landing practice and so on. But, you know, again, time permitting, as long as you get to practice some emergency procedures. So customize your flight and then talk to your instructor, agree on what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. And then, of course, there's the flight portion. Um, I, I'll come back to that towards the end. Currently, uh, the latest guidance that I'm aware of, the Hobbs meter should be no more than 1.5. And there are, that's kind of the group level, but there are some non cap IP um, pilots who are authorized to be instructors for this flight clinic. So that sort of increases the pool, but that you have to go through your group and find out who is in that list. So we're going to start with some refresher topics real quick. Uh, some crosswind normal, crash, uh, normal takeoffs and landings, of course, but also crosswind takeoffs and landings that are important. Go rounds, short field takeoffs and landings, air work. Again, you, I'm not going to talk up into detail about really any of these, but it's about this is some other refresher topics you might consider throwing in to your flight if you have time and electrical system issues. The topics for this emergency procedures and this is not a um, exhaustive list. I, we added actually some more. We just can fit them all in the, in the list in one slide. So we're going to talk a, quite a bit about power loss and takeoff. What you might have heard as the impossible turn that may or may not be impossible depending on the situation. We're going to talk about all sorts of fires. We're going to talk about altitude loss during turns and why you would want to know that. Power loss, but all the way down to a landing. Landing with no electricity. Emergency operation in clouds. So think of like a VFR into IMC scenario. And then landing without elevator control. Oh, yeah, landing with a flat tire. We also added that towards the end, too. Of course, the question with the flat tire, we'll get to that, is how do you even know you have a flat tire? We'll talk about it then. So refresh your topics. I, I, you can ask questions at any time, but somebody will have to tell me that there's a question because all I can see is my screen right now. But please jump in. And let's try to make this. Um, interactive. So a little regulatory review as it's relevant for this flight clinic. Remember the crosswind component for ASPR 70-1 is whatever is in the POH. So for a 182 it's going to be 15. If, if, if a plane doesn't have a maximum demonstrated uh, published number for this maximum demonstrated crosswind component is 15, but for uh, the most of our 182s, at least, it's 15. For the 206, it's 20. Make sure it doesn't mean that if it's 15 or less, you're good to go. You might, everybody should have their own personal minimums. If you don't feel comfortable with, for example, 12 knots of crosswind, you should not be attempting it. And you should not be raising your personal minimum in the air. You can go with an instructor, you can go in a simulator, but these are the regulatory maximums. And these are some some others from typical planes that we have. I said 182 is 15, 172s, it changes with flaps. 
whatever plane you fly, make sure you're familiar with what that is. And anytime it blows more than 30 knots, even including gas, we cannot fly. This is, of course, surface winds, not, not winds aloft. There is an approval process with SFRO and then the wind commander, their cooperation. So there is that, but really think twice or three times about it. And remember, there's, of course, there's the takeoff and landing distance calculation that we you, you probably are used to doing it, but now that comes into play when we, uh, um, with some of these emergency procedures. Here's one example. Um, well, actually, the told comes later, but for touch and go landings, if you're going to practice that, you require 3,000 feet length of runway, sum and takeoff landing rolls, again, the told. And there's another example here. Uh, yeah, this we also have a toll calculator, uh, the really useful collection of tools, the mobile tools for PCR CAP. Please, if you haven't um, visited them, please do so because you can also find a check pilot. You can also find information about our planes. Really useful things. So the toll comes into play here, 3,000 feet for touch and goes. Uh, if you want to do a power off simulated force landing, as 70 does one calls it, but really it's a power off landing. You can do this at 5,000 feet of runway or 3,000 if you have a cap instructor on board. This is not, this is a specific meaning. So a cap instructor pilot is a CFI who has the uh, instructor pilot appointment. So here the meaning is very specific. All stall, slow flight, all basically air work should complete by 1,500 feet AGL. And that's for many of the maneuvers, not all. This is what we're using in this flight clinic. If you're going to do a simulated force landing and you're not going to land, outside of gliding this to runway, as it says here, you cannot go less than 500 feet. I would advise a little higher, just in case the engine doesn't start quite as smoothly. And by start, I mean power up. It should al always be running uh, quite as smoothly. 5,000 feet, remember, over non-congested areas, because there's also the FAA regulations, 1,000 feet over congested areas. We cannot do simulated emergency procedures during IMC or at night as well. There's some exception like partial pan instrument approaches, but yeah, not not very relevant. You know, if please try to fly a day. It's um, a, a lot of um, because we're going to do some exciting things in the flight clinic and it really should be done a day, partly for this regulation, but also for risk management. So take off some landing, short field, follow the POH, nice and simple, but when it comes to a short field takeoff, for example, it's more important to brief the engine. I mean, it's always important, but it's even more important in, in a short field takeoff to brief the engine failure procedure, just because you're going to be flying or climbing out at a higher angle of attack. You just have to act faster. It gives you less of a time to reduce the pitch. In other words, push the nose down, probably more than you might expect. So you have to be sort of primed and ready for it. Safety force, and now in the landings, safety first. I've had, as a CFI, you know, I've had students because, you know, we usually tell them touch down by this, by this stripe, by this marker, you know, whatever. And, and they come in on a landing and they carry too much um, airspeed. And then when they flare, the plane floats, so they try to force it down. That's exactly the wrong thing to do. The moment you flare on a short field landing, you're done. The plane will touch down when it touches down. All your corrections and everything should be done beforehand by proper airspeed control, aiming, angle of attack management, and so on. The moment you flare, you don't force the plane to touch down because otherwise somebody might be buying a new nose wheel and firewall. We don't want to do that. That's expensive. So, so do not force the plane down. Go around and try it again. Treat it like an, like an actual short field. You have 1,500 feet of runway that you're landing. I'm not going to make the runway. I'm going to go around. I'm going to try it again. Watch for tail strikes, especially in a 172, especially in a 206, watch your descent rate. They uh, come down faster than you might think, especially if you're doing it for the first time. Okay, moving on to a little bit more of the emergency stuff. Can Let's try to make this interactive. Can anybody tell me what is the difference between emergency and abnormal? Either chat or you can speak up too. And you know, in the in the I would say yeah. an emergency would indicate that the consequences are not going to be good unless action is taken. Okay, what about okay, you're on the right path. Great. Uh, what about ab abnormal? Well, does it have something to do with the amount of time you have to deal with it? 
It could be. It could be. It only depends on the situation. So I, I, I'll just say this differentiation, um, larger uh, um, jet flying, I guess, um, broadly speaking, is better at differentiating it. We're not that good at part 91 at differentiating it. An emergency is something that threatens the safety of people on board or on the ground. So the safe completion of flight is in question. An abnormal situation is one where it's no longer possible to continue the flight during normal procedures, but, and that's the key thing, the safety is not in question. So let me ask you, a wing fire or an energy fire, some kind of fire, I, is that an emergency or abnormal? Emergency. emergency. It's an emergency. Your flap's not working. Is that abnormal or emergency? Abnormal. Abnormal. Exactly. That that's the difference. The one of the reasons we're bringing it up here is if if a situation is by by this definition at least it's not an emergency. Don't make it into one. Like if your flaps don't work, don't try to land at the 1500 feet of runway while being rushed. You 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 have like 50 gallons of fuel. You can go in a long long runway, do as many go arounds as you want, and at land. So. Keep that in mind. Electrical fuel issues. We've had a collection of failures. Um, I've, I've, I've actually had two alternative failures on the same cup aircraft in the same day. So they do happen. And by the previous definition, you know, they're not an emergency. They, they might make navigating harder uh, because uh, they might make communications harder. Absolutely. But the plane's not going to fall off the sky. It still flies. So training a preparation prevents this abnormal situation from becoming an emergency. And I, reading accident reports, this is not in CAP, but the reading accident reports, oftentimes a way an abnormal becomes, uh, this kind of abnormal becomes an emergency is because the pilot hasn't practiced landing without flaps, especially in, in, in a 206 or like a heavier plane. So let's practice and keep a, a skill shared. And of course, knowing the systems of your plane is essential. Um, on the G1000, if you lose your alternator, what, what is the very first indicator? Here's another question for the group. What is the very first indication that the alternator has died? Or discharging. discharging. Exactly. Indication. You don't get an enunciator un un until the voltage drops to 24.5. This is for a G1182. And, but you do see the discharge. The key is you have to be looking at it and include it in your scan. Anyway, we're not going to go through all that, but basically know the electrical status of your plane. Over voltage is a concern. Run the appropriate checklist. Th those are the key things. And then know how to shed load. So if you detect this early, you have more options because you have more battery life left. If you and to detect this early, scan every now and then, keep it in your scan, basically the electrical status um, system, the amps and the volts. You can also try to recycle the alternator once, that might work, but you can also consider keeping the high load items that are useful for landing. Let me rephrase that better. Keeping battery life so that you can use these high load items that help you to land. Radio to talk to tower, lighting so they can see you, flaps, gear, we don't have any complex planes in CAP, but you know, j just in principle. And of course, you have to shed the load, know what that means in your plane. And you might also consider, th th this are, you know, I'm not giving you things that you have to do, these are all considerations in your toolbox um, by knowing your situation and approximately maybe how much battery life you have. So if you're coming into land and you have enough flaps, I mean, I'm sorry, you have power to put down flaps, you might consider not going full flaps because by the time you go full flaps until the time you might have to go around, the battery might be dead by then. So you might be trying to go around with full flaps and that doesn't work in many planes. So you might consider only using the amount of flaps that is approved for takeoff and climb up. So in a 182 G1000, for example, that's 20 degrees of flaps because it, you can take off with 0 to 20 in, in that plane. All right. So, and then, it, you know, everything, a, a lot of what we're talking about here is going to tie into your flight planning. 
add the alternate of failure possibility to your contingency planning. So have a plan B, have a plan B that may maybe it's a, it's an airport without a control tower that you wouldn't have to talk to if you don't have radio, or it's a longer runway so you can land without flaps. If you're gonna fly an IMC, it's good to have a VMC out. If not, take that into account in your risk management. And involve ATC early. I mean, I uh, only a couple of times I had to do this, but really they've been really helpful. I tell Tower, hey, I I have power right now, but I lost my alternator, so I might lose radio. And they they're usually pretty helpful, and it's great to tell them so they can get the light gun signal, you know, ready, the light gun rather uh, ready. Instead of, oh, wait, this plane is not responding, why? And then sort of having them figure it out. And as we said, practice no flap landings for all the reasons that we talked about. So we're going to move into more of the emergency procedures. Let's pause here for some questions. Does anybody have anything to talk about? Okay, nothing hurts, so moving on. So topics about, uh, more specific about emergency procedures. We talk, uh, I sort of gave you a little teaser about the e possible turn. What that is, is you lose, you're gonna lose the engine on takeoff. The question is, can you return? Um, it's labeled by many, not by all, as the impossible turn because it's, it's hard to do. I even though if you do get yourself in that situation, your temptation might be to come back. So what we're going to try to do in this flight clinic, in of course in a safe manner, is have you practice it in altitude. So you can see how it feels like, you can see how much altitude you lose. So you can sort of have a better understanding of the maneuver, how difficult it is, how much altitude it needs. So you can, you know, if that happens to you, have more, be able to make a better decision at the time. So can we make it a possible turn? And there's a lot of risk management that goes in, into play in aeronautical decision making. What is in front of you matters. If you're, uh, if you lose the engine on a takeoff, and in front of you there's nice grass fields that are nice and smooth, and there's even a den is right next to it, so you can even go for lunch while you're waiting for the cruise to arrive. All that makes the landing straight ahead scenario much less risky. So if you lose your engine or say at an altitude that's not clear if you're going to make it or not based on the training you're about to receive, well, wh why push it? Maybe you can consider landing on that field. I, you know, everybody's primed on landing at airports and that's great, but you, you, we have to have a certain confidence that we can make it, uh, make it back to the airport in this case or land at an airport when we lose it, the engine in flight uh, because otherwise you might be trying to make it back and get yourself in a situation that's worse than just landing on that nice green field that, that's ahead of you. There's no golden rule about it. You just have to practice and develop judgment to apply in that situation. Let's decide how we're gonna practice this possible, impossible turn, however you wanna do it. Just, we, we call it power loss uh, takeoff really in this clinic. So, so we practice. And a big part of this is let's determine how much altitude we're going to need to make the turn. Now we're going to practice that altitude for safety. Uh, in practice, if you do lose this, uh, your engine on takeoff, wind, headwind is your friend because it keeps you closer to an airport. So that's another consideration you need to make. Because if, say, for example, you're, you're taking off and there's no wind, well, you're going to complete the turn, but now you also have to glide back to the airport. But if you have headwind, it's going to keep you closer to the airport. You have less of a gliding to do. So that's another factor that goes into your judgment. For this flight clinic, you know, remember 70-1, it said uh, all maneuvers basically have to end at 1,500 feet AGL, stalls and such. Here, we'd like to complete the turn. Uh, complete the turn, not start the turn, uh, no, no lower than 2000 AGL. The, re the reason is because of this, of they're gonna do like a high, ba high bank turn. You're not gonna get close to stall, but hopefully you might be tempted to pull back. We're gonna talk about that a little bit, but, but just have that number in mind. So how this maneuver works, I'm gonna come back to the question of airspeed and bank in just a minute, but how this works is 
line up with a ground reference, road, runway, something. Apply climb power and trim for VY. So you're basically simulating the climb out right after takeoff. Slowly, please be gentle to the plane. Um, slowly retard the throttle to idle. In fact, I would recommend this. Like if you're going to do this in a 206, for example, especially a turbo 206, you might consider like 182 or 172 because like we're going from 23 inches to idle and that's not great for high performance engines. So use your judgment, monitor your temperatures, close the cow flaps also as soon as you go idle. Uh, so, but in any case, th th these are things to think about. There is no prohibition against any particular makes and models. Just let's be nice to our engines. So slowly retard the throttle idle and note the altitude. That's a key thing. So you're going to lose the engine, note the altitude. Wait three seconds. And why do you wait three seconds? Because if this does happen to you, well, you're not going to react right away. You're going to go through a few seconds, actually three seconds is a little optimistic, of the, oh, no, what just happened? It couldn't have happened to me. No, it happens to other people only. You know, that kind of thing. It's the startle effect. There's a lot of literature around the startle effect, great reads. There's some seminars about it. You can look at that into later. The only thing you're going to do in th those three seconds is basically maintain speed, don't stall, drop the nose. And then start your turn. If there's some crosswind, turn into the wind. Because if you turn away from the wind, the crosswind is going to blow you away. Now, if this happens to you at an airport that has parallel runways, you might consider turning into the direction of the other runway. So roll into a turn. We're going to suggest for the first time you do it. So in the syllabus, we say 30 to 60 is fair game, but we suggest 45. Reason is 45 banks, 45 degrees of bank is something you've done before. You've done this in steep turns. So it should be a little more familiar. In fact, there was an article um, that sort of did the math and showed that in many cases, 45 degrees is actually the optimal because at 60, you start having a lot of drag. So at least start with 45 degrees of bank. And you can also start with best glide speed because you've practiced this before. You know what best glide speed looks like. The key here is maintain constant spin. This is not a level turn because you don't have power. You cannot make it a level turn if, if, even if you try it. So it, you're going to drop the nose as far as it needs to go to maintain constant speed and be gentle about it. So you're going to establish a 45 degree back turn at base glide speed with the nose as low as it needs to be. You're basically trading off altitude for speed. And this is sort of like uh, th the first time you do it, you can try this again. You can try different uh, different bank angles. You can fr fl uh, try different speeds too. You can try a little lower if you'd like. We'd still like you to be above the glide speed at that bank angle for a level turn, plus a margin, something like like 10 knots. And this is uh, wait, I, I'm going to go a little out of order here because I have this reminder now. I did say that this is not a level turn, so you're not going to load the wings. The stall speed is not going to increase. The reason we want you to stay above the stall speeds at this bank angle is because you might be tempted to pull back. Because the side picture is going to look a little weird. It's going to look a, a lot like it, it's going to look something that you haven't really done before. It's, the nose is going to be da more down than you, th than you think with a turn. The pilot might be tempted to pull back, so you might momentarily increase the uh, the stall speed. So let's. So these are the stall speeds in a 170, a 182. I'm sorry, with a G1000 with different bank angles. So let's try to stay above those, something like like 10 knots. And but starting off a good glide uh, glide speed, best glide speed is good. So. This is the, the turn. You're going to start the turn. You're going to turn more than 180. So so think of where's actually let's go back. I'm sorry for a little out of order. I thought yeah. So you're going to turn more than 180 degrees. Why? Well, because you took off, you turn around. If you just rolled out at 180, you're going to parallel the runway. You're going to be looking at the runway on your side window and wishing you were there. 
Instead, what you what you should do is turn 180 plus some to get you back lined up to the runway. In this case, we suggest 30 degrees. You can do also do 45. It really has to do like if this happens to you, it really has to do with how much headwind you have, because that's going to give you how much space, like how many miles you have to line up. But anyway, you can do 180 plus 80 or 35. You're going to roll the wings. You're going to go straight. And you're going to, um, let me clarify, you're going to turn 180 plus some, and then you're going to turn away in the other direction to roll back to the initial ground reference point. So you're going to turn 180, 180 degrees plus 30, and then you're going to turn 30 the other way to line up with your imaginary runway. And at that point, you note the altitude loss. Because remember, when you power down, you're going to, uh, you know that the altitude that you power down and one of the points of this maneuver is to teach you how much altitude it actually needs. So note the altitude as you level the wings, because that will tell you how much altitude you lost in that whole turn to line the back to the runway. Now, you might not be done yet. You might just need more altitude to establish your approach. You might not have like a perfect light speed uh, control throughout the maneuver. And I think we talked about this. Yeah, so uh, it's also good to have a margin. This refers to altitude. So have a margin altitude. Say that you do this maneuver and you say, oh, I, I need it like 800 feet. Well, yeah, but situations change, uh, winds change. Uh, you know, if this happens to you, you're not going to fly this as well as you do in practice. So it's good that you, the number that you keep in mind, add, add a margin. So I think that's. Uh, that's all for the impossible turn or possible turn. So let me pause for any questions here. Hey, Giorgio, one thing I would mention is that uh, one of the reasons you may be doing the turn is because you're in an urban area. And when you're turning back, you may not want to be so dedicated to the runway, but maybe just the airport environment. In other words, you don't want to stall it trying to line up with the runway. You may just make the airport environment. That is a great point. Yeah, and, and thank you for making it. There's also been successful attempts at similar situations where people lined up and, and landed on taxiways. That's perfectly fine. Go back to safety. If it's an urban environment where you have a skyscraper in front of you, yes, and also take that into account your pre-flight planning. Uh, so, like, be sure you know where there's like a park or something or, or, or a highway or something that you might consider landing on. It doesn't mean you should if it's a busy highway, if it's a busy park or something, but basically know your options on takeoff. Is it true it's about 600 feet per minute altitude loss in a turn with an engine failure? It depends on, it's, it's hard to attach a, 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 a number. It, it depends on a bunch of things. I will say though, that's the ballpark, but situations might differ. You might also consider, I, I think we'll have that discussion later. If, you, if you're flying a 182 or 206, what can you do to reduce the drag? What, what can you do with the propeller to reduce the drag? Bring it towards feather. Yeah, you're not going to feather it. We cannot feather it. You know, kind of wish we did, but but you're right. We'd go uh, take the RPM knob, put it all the way out. That reduces the RPM, that reduces drag. I, it, I, what that will do to you, I mean, it depends on situations and conditions. But last time I tried it, it was about a 200 feet per minute gain. So it's it, it's something. But for the practice, when you practice this, I recommend against it. The reason is when you terminate this maneuver you're going to be primed to pull the throttle in. And we're not used to thinking about the RPM knob when we go around because we've already said that fully. So don't touch the RPM number you practice it. It's also useful to not touch it, sort of to give you like a worst case. But the RPM knob, if this does happen to you in real life, is another tool in your toolbox. You might consider using it. Okay, so yeah, there's there's a lot of courses about, and, and online material about this uh, possible and possible turn. Here's a particular one from NAFI. It's an FAA Wings course. You might consider taking it. It also gives you credit. Really good stuff. So moving on, 
Um, another one is an inoperative airspeed indicator. So you're flying along and I know something goes in your pitot tube or didn't do a good pre-flight or something, and now your airspeed indicator says zero. So things to consider in, in that situation. First off, the plane still flies. So it's really just a matter of like, how are you gonna um, judge how much energy the plane has when you're coming into land? When you're cruising, remember that power and attitude equals airspeed. So you can put your like cruise uh, configuration, manifold pressure, RPM, you can put your usual cruise attitude, and that will give you an airspeed that would be your usual cruise airspeed. It's, you're not going to get it out of the airspeed indicator, but it's going to be a cruise airspeed, meaning the plane will be flying just fine. Now, when, you're fl when you actually want to come into land, what you're going to try to do, I mean, obviously, if you're flying a plane with an angle of attack indicator, that, that, that's great. But if you don't fly such a plane, you're going to try to gauge sort of the angle of attack of the plane just to give you an idea of how close you are to stall. Now, of course, the stall warning should still work. So please, if that comes on, you can go around, you can add power, reduce your angle of attack. So basically respond to that. You can also you should also be watching for other signs of stall. What that is, is like a buffet, sluggish controls, things you should be familiar with for practicing stalls in that plane. Also remember the sound of the wind, like if, yeah, the slower you go, the, uh, the less it is. So, but say that you're coming into land and you have an aim point and you know you're going towards that aim point because you're using the spot method. And what that means is you're looking at something, I, it could be the numbers or it could be like the, the thousand touchstone points. I recommend not the threshold for these things, just like 500 feet down or a thousand feet down if you have enough runway. But anyway, you have your aiming point. You know you're going to it because it doesn't move up or down your windshield. It stays constant and all it does is it grows larger. So you can sort of estimate your angle of attack by looking at the attitude of the plane, assuming that your glide path remains towards your aiming point. You, if you notice that I'm still going towards my point, but now my nose is higher, well, that means that now you have a higher angle of attack. So these are some considerations. When you do practice this, um, I recommend treating it like a, as an, um, a power of landing in terms of the runway length requirements, because what happens more often than not is the pilot overcompensates and they come in too fast, so the plane just floats and floats and floats, which is perfectly fine. If this happens to you on on, on a real situation, just have that in mind. You might consider using a longer runway, so you are um, you don't have to get your estimation that we're talking about here just right. You have more of a margin to go faster. By the way, th th this situation is is partly why it's a good idea when you're on the takeoff roll to make sure your airspeed indicator responds and it's alive. So if you're going to practice this on a G1000, you can dim the PFD and you can also cover the backup attitude, uh, I mean airspeed in indicator. And uh, in other planes like Rwanda, just, just, you can just cover the um, airspeed indicator. Uh, Major? Yes. A uh, quick question. Now now we have all these gadgets in the airplane that give us uh, uh, ground speed. What is your what are your thoughts on 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 that? Yes, yeah, so, so that's a good question. It's a it's a tool in your toolbox. However, using the ground speed as a replacement, I guess um, you have to know the winds just right. And the, for example, the G1000 is not going to tell you the winds if it doesn't have an airspeed. So you have to know the winds just right. And what, that, what does that mean? I, it's hard because like if you're flying somewhere with an ATIS, that could be an, uh, those wind reports could be one hour old. Uh, you could be looking at the windsock, but then like, is it 11 knots or is it 15 knots? It's kind of hard to know exactly. So I, I would say practice using it. My recommendation would be to use the ground speed as a backup. You know, if your ground speed is a hundred knots, uh, unless you know you have a 40 knot tailwind, which in case you should not be landing at that runway, uh, that probably means you're too fast. If your ground speed is 20 knots, you know, same thing. 
So use it as a part of your situation awareness as an extra information tool, but it has a bunch of downsides. It's not a replacement. At least that's my recommendation, but, but thank you for the question. That was a good question. Okay, fires. Things are going on fire. So review the POH. There's a POH, I mean, there's a emergency procedures for a lot of these situations. Make sure you know them, especially the memory items, the bold face items in the G1, the newer planes that they have bold items. But even in the older planes, it kind of like, like you can look at the checklist, it makes sense what you might want to do fast. And that's the whole point of bold face. Prioritize. And then we're going into like what kind of fire we're talking about here. If it's an energy fire, so none of what I'm talking here replaces the POH, run the checklist. But some considerations are, for like, for example, energy fire, starve it of fuel. How do you, how you do that? You can turn off the fuel, you can pull the mixture. There's also in some POH you say descend fast over 100 knots, trying to put the fire out. That might work. Electrical fire, well, starve it of current. Uh, turn off the alternator, turn off the battery, close the vents. And, you know, once you do that, you sort of have to have to make an assessment, meaning is the fire still going? If it's not going, well, you might have more time. You should still land, but you might consider having more time. If the fire is still going on, and if it's a fire on your side of the firewall, meaning or like on the, on, on the, the, the pretty screens and the old gadgets we have in our planes, well, that can spread pretty fast. So you might consider landing, uh, doing an emergency descent. I think I have a slide for that coming up, but all these considerations sort of change your decision making. Wing fire. So fire is more likely on sort of on the outside because that's where the electronics are. Think of strobes, navigation, maybe a little closer in from the landing lights, maybe, but your main goal is to keep the fire away from the fuel tank obviously right fuel fire they they like hanging out with each other but we don't want them to do that so what you're trying to do in that situation is basically trying to keep the fire on, uh, from spreading towards the inside step on the fire with the rudder and do opposite aileron because what that does is that it keeps the flames away away from the body of the plane away from the fuel tank and a root fire if whatever happens is much more problematic. And you're still going to try to keep the flame away from fuels, uh, but uh, from the fuel tank, by sort of doing the opposite as the outward fire. But that will direct the flames towards the cabin. So that's why it's sort of a lot more problematic. And thankfully, it's also less likely. So an electrical fire in flight, which is like the, the avionics, this is, what, uh, this is from a G1182 POH. Turn, see, the memory atoms are to turn off the the standby battery and the master switch basically starve it from current close the cabin vents to avoid drafts and then use your fire to ensure that of course you all know where it is and you all know how to use and you inspect it before flying right so use your fire extinguisher that doesn't mean that it's definitely will the fire will stop but you're gonna try to do what you can and that's where going back to what we said before. Now, if you do all that, you run through the entire checklist, make sure you know what's going on and, and decide accordingly. And be careful with the warning. Like after you use the fire extinguisher, uh, you have to remove smoke from the cabin. And then there's cabin fire. Now, what's cabin fire that's not electrical fire where it could be in the back seat there, there's still some electrics in the back seat it could be in the baggage compartment who knows but it's sort of a similar situation okay so as we said before you, you run all the checklists and the electrical file is still going on you have to get down fast because they can spread real quickly i was reading an article a long time ago some poor cfi lost a toe because of an electrical fire it just spread so quickly can anybody, does anybody want to chime in? How do you descend fast in this plane? And when I say fast, I mean optimize how quickly you're on the ground. Try to slip. 
Slip. Slip. Yes, spiral. Steep spiral. Yep. All good answers. The, so in the uh, planes uh, uh, that we have, unless I'm forgetting, at, at least the G1182s, they don't have a procedure in the POH for an emergency descent. So you have to assess the situation and you have, based on your practice, you have to know what works for that plane. A steep spiral or a slip could work. What I usually do is a steep spiral with flaps. So something like this. 45 degree bank full flaps, top of the wide arc, meaning 100 knots in a G1182. Now, it's not the only way to do it. You can also do this straight ahead. You can also do something else. I would. That's partly why we're having this flight clinic. So you first have experienced this, but also see what it does for you. Uh, last time I tried this, it was about, uh, it was a pretty exciting descent, more than a thousand feet per minute, I think actually well over a thousand feet per minute. So, but what's interesting and why it's good at practice is you, to maintain a hundred knots, you have to push your nose down quite a bit because with full flaps of 45 degrees, you just have a lot of drag. So that's one way of doing it. There's no procedure in the POH. If you fly out other planes, like a, I think a Duchess has one or a Piper Arrow, I, I forget. There's a, some of them have a procedure. But in any case, of course, remember, you're going to do the spiral. That assumes that you can land basically right below you. If you cannot land right below you for whatever reason, you might want to do this, but straight ahead. So, so without the bank. So use your judgment. Absolutely. And if you do do this turn, remember that you do have to roll out at some point because you have to line up and actually land. You cannot land on a steep spiral. So there's a lot of judgment that comes into play here. Can I ask uh, if if you turn off all your electrical equipment though you you wouldn't turn it back on to put flaps down right you that would just not be an option if yeah so that's that's a good point so and that's where judgment comes in you're right you might have to do this without flaps absolutely right the other way of doing it is this without flaps and if it's smoother top of the green arc Of course, the, the, there could be situation like, like for example, if there's a fire in the baggage compartment, well, then you you have a little more time to put the flaps down, for for example. All right. So, so engine failures. Remember your A, B, C's and more D and E. So A is for airspeed, best glide speed. It's a checklist memory item. You should know what the glide speed is. Does anybody remember what the glide speed depends on? Weight. Weight, very good. B, best field. So do this from memory. Glide speed, because the sooner you go to glide speed, the more options you have, meaning you can go to more places. Best field, so that you keep going somewhere productive. In other words, you don't spend like two minutes troubleshooting while going towards a building. You're going towards somewhere that you might want to land. Use your crew. I didn't talk about CRM in a lot of this presentation, but it sort of implied in a lot of the things we do in CAP. Use your crew. Your crew may be looking at fields or landing spots that you might not, it might be hard for you to see, like from the left seat. Use your crew in a lot of this, not just reading the checklist. And then we do a cost check. Now, you should do this either from memory and then use the uh, reference the checklist or just read the checklist if you have time. That's a judgment call that you have to do. But basically run the checklist. That's, that is um, the, the engine failure in flight starts with troubleshooting. Try to restart the engine. So for example, in a 182G1000, that is the fuel pump, the electrical fuel pump. You have to turn it on, mixture, magnetos. Uh, of course, you know, when we practice, we pull the power back and the you know the engine just nicely windmills and everybody's smiling and all that but if that happens to you in the air you might hear a bang you might have oil on, on the windshield so it's it's not a this nice situation that we're all used to but what does happen to the engine might give you a clue of what the problem is if you see oil on the windshield uh, chances are you might not be able to restart it for example but anyway do your checklist do the course check Talk to somebody, do a distress call. Uh, if you're talking to ATC, just use that frequency. And 
emergency power of landing. Again, there's a checklist for that. If you have time, run it. And that checklist will basically take you through how to prepare for a power of landing, like latch the doors open, turn off the master, that kind of thing. So these are the A, B, C, D, and E's. Now, POHs have a have a glide chart. So that will give you sort of an idea how far this plane can glide. This is from a 182 G1000. It's roughly A to 1. So you can glide 8 miles for every mile that you're high. Now, of course, you have to do a conversion between feet because the altimeter reads feet to a mile. But it's, you know, roughly A to 1. But let's be very aware of how this chart was generated. These are test pilot numbers, but basically any any chart in the POH is really test pilot numbers, like the landing distances and so on. So that assumes perfect technique. Um, so leave a margin, but also the propellers windmilling flaps up zero wind. These are some assumptions that went into this chart. If you're going to glide into the wind, you're not going to glide as far or with flaps. Also notice something different. Does the glide distance depend on our weight? What do you think? No, it just affects the speed of descent. Exactly. It changes the speed that you want for best glide, but it doesn't change the distance. If you fly G1000, where you have that night SB tape and you have these markers, remember that those markers are usually set for maximum weight. So know your best flight speed. If you don't, that chart is is you're not you're not gonna get eight to one if if, if you don't fly as um, the best flight speed. Okay. So what other factors determine glide distance? Well, turns out it's a whole bunch. So. Wind, both headwind and crosswind. And remember that the wind actually changes as altitude changes. Usually it reduces, but only usually. It might change directions as well, or it might increase. Precise airspeed control, we talked about the flaps. The moment you put down flaps, so remember, like if you have your landing spot right in front of you, and it kind of looks like you're going to make it, but with not a whole lot of margin, you use the spot method. The moment you put down flaps, that's going to change how you glide towards it. That's going to make it worse. When the flaps come down, they're going to increase the lift momentarily, but they're also going to increase drag. So they're not going to let you glide as far. So if you have a good glide that doesn't have a lot of cushion or extra, you know, basically room to spare, you might want to hold off on the flaps until either last moment or just land without flaps. Again, judgment. RPM control. We talked about it. I don't recommend using it in practice because you might end up applying throttle without putting the RPM back. So don't use it for practice in this clinic, but know that it's something that you can actually use. Now, if you talk to your CFI and you're both very comfortable and you come up with a procedure to make sure you don't apply power with before RPM, you, you can actually do it to see what it does for you. Like, again, last time I tried, it was like 200 feet per minute. But I don't recommend it unless you're very sure that you're not going to apply power without putting the RPM no back in. Because that's pretty bad for the engine. So, and then, yeah, so gliding, other considerations. Well, when we talk about gliding, we usually talk about going straight. But you might have to maneuver, make turns, really, to line up with wherever you're landing at. And turns might will increase your drag. So they're going to mess up your glide. So how can you judge your glide performance? Spot method, we talked about it. Look at your windshield. Whatever is stationary on the windshield is where you're going. You might consider an EFB, but be absolutely sure that, A, you're familiar with it. You know what it's actually telling you, and it knows the winds, and it knows the current winds, not just the winds from five hours ago. You might do some quick calculations based on your gadgets, your GPS reported ground speed, or judgment based on pre-flight planning. Like, you've picked your route knowing that you can make this airport, for example. So that increases your confidence. It doesn't mean that it's a guarantee. Nothing is really a guarantee here. It's just that it increases your confidence. That, can anybody think of any other tool that I missed here? OK. Nothing? All right, good, good. All right, so wind. 
This is from an FAA handbook. I think it's the airplane flying handbook. So best flight speed will make the runway. Too fast or too slow will not make the runway. It's, uh, you know, if this does happen to you, um, this is saying that says that your left arm might start getting shorter because your tendency is to, I want to extend the glide. I really want to make it. And how do we do that? By pulling back because we don't want to descend. Well, that might have a momentary benefit, but it reduces your speed, makes you too slow. You're not going to make it. The best you can do is best glide speed. And of course, strong headwind. If you have stronger, so this goes back into the glider world a little bit. If any of you are familiar, like the speed to fly. If you have, a, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just throwing it out there as like as a teaser, so you can read up more on this. There's a whole theory behind it. So don't just, you know, use. Um, th there's more to it. It's not as simple as it might sound here, just because we don't have the time for it to go into detail. But if you have a lot of headwind going in, you might want to increase your airspeed just a little bit over glide speed, just so you lessen the the impact of the headwind on your ground speed as a percentage. But you have to be sure to do it. Anyway, take that as a teaser. Still, glide speed is, in most cases, all almost all cases, the best we can do. But And use your spot method. Your spot method will also tell you if you're going towards the runway, so you can make adjustments accordingly. <clears throat> okay, so if, you're, if you have a plan and you want to go somewhere, recognize early, the earlier you do it, recognize if you're, if you're not going to make it. It's actually, I, and you know, if you plan on going somewhere, have high confidence that you're actually going to make it. Because the problem is, if you're going to say, I, I want to go towards an airport, but I'm not actually sure if if I'm going to make it. I'm not like 100%. I, 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 I'm not 100% plus margin. I'm not I, I, absolutely sure. The question there is, well, do you really want to try it? And then it depends on what's around you. Because what might happen is you might try to go to that airport. You might not make it for, you know, whatever reason. But at that point your other options are not good because that airport might be next to houses. On the other hand, when you first run the question through your mind, should I even go through that airport? At that point, you might have some other great options. You might have a, not an airport, but you might have a field. You might have something else that is a lot better. So you have to use your judgment to make sure how confident you are to go to that landing spot and what that does to your options if you don't make it to that landing spot. So spot method, if the object is rising on your glare sheet, windshield, you're, you're going to be sure. Giorgio, that's a good point. Um, during one of my actual engine failures, uh, I was kind of faced with this and ATC kept trying to convince me I should go to a different, the closest airport, but it was just, it was urban. Whereas an airport that was a little bit further uh, was fields. And so it's, it's definitely something to consider. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. And even though, they're looking at it on the radar scope that you're closer to a different airport and you get, you have to make that judgment. That's a great point. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for bringing it up. ATC is a helpful resource. They can provide you with information, but they're not flying the plane for you. They don't know what you know. They don't see what you see. You have to make your own judgment. But thanks for bringing it up. That's a great point. Okay. So yeah, confidence actually making the chosen spot will increase your chance of success. So here we're giving you another toolbox and another tool in your toolbox, not a procedure, not a rule, but another tool in your toolbox to increase your confidence to if you're going to make a, a certain spot. So remember the glide ratio for these planes, as we saw before, is eight to ones for the 182 G1000s. Again, other planes might have something different. Look at your POH. Uh, the, the method that we're talking about here, I'm going to talk about here, is 8 on 8. So what that looks like is the 8 on 8 takes the 8 to 1 glide slope and add, adds a, fa a fudge factor, a margin. Why? Well, you're not a test pilot. The conditions are not perfect. Like, it's, it's not an ideal world. So are you going to make the 8 to 1 glide slope? Well, you know, maybe, but there's many reasons why you might not make the 8 to 1 glide slope if this happens to you for real. 
So the eight on eight, it also simplifies the math, by the way. So for example, at 8,000 feet, AGL, remember we talk about all these considerations are talking about AGL, you should be able to glide at least eight miles with a higher confidence. So if you look at the eight to one ratio by the book, that would be a 12 mile distance. So eight on eight, which is eight miles, that's four miles shorter. That's your fudge factor. Again, this is not a procedure. This is not a rule. We're not saying that you, like there are many situations where you can glide farther than the eight to eight. It's just a tool to increase your confidence that if something is within the eight to eight, well, you know, I have a higher chance of making it. But again, use your judgment. So if something does, if you do have to make a decision in the air, look at the three levels at the bottom of the slide. If your target is within the eight to eight, you'll probably make it. And you might even have some wiggle room to maneuver. Be careful with winds, but you'll probably make it. If you, if if it's outside eight on eight, but within eight to one, well, use judgment and good flying. You might be able to make it, you might not. It really depends on everything we just talked about here. And if it's outside eight to one, well, you're probably not gonna make it. The Really, the, the only way you can make it, if there's a good tailwind to to push you there. So all things to consider, but use your judgment and good flying. Okay. So oftentimes when we fly a form fives, we you know we, we fail the engine, we do a glide, we run the checklist, and then we terminate it at a thousand feet or five hundred feet. What we'd like to do in this emergency clinic is actually land. So lose your engine at, at say 5,000 feet, 3,000 feet, and then actually land on, on a runway. Of course, if you're going to do this, please make sure you're not going to conflict with traffic. Please make sure, you know, all, all the safety factors are taken into account. Best done, of course, at the airport without control tower, where it's not busy, follow the, the traffic pattern rules, um, and so on. So, but if we want to break down this procedure in components that we've practiced before, that increases our chance of success. So what that means is we have sort of the high altitude portion practiced from a form fives. That means fly, best glide, checklist, all that. And you're going to position the plane down with the BBD numbers at a thousand feet. Ideally, it doesn't mean that you can definitely do it, but if you can, consider doing that. Why? Well, because number two is something that you've also practiced. You've also practiced a thousand feet uh, or done with altitude, you know, whatever the pattern, the traffic pattern altitude is, but normally it's a thousand feet power of landing from a, from a beam the numbers. We've, we've practiced that uh, at various stages in, in, in our training. So number two, you've practiced many times. Number one, you've practiced many times. So if you combine the two, that gives the, the combination that is more likely to succeed because it, it uses skills you've developed more. Yeah, so I think that's stuff that we talked about before. Choose a landing spot, head to it as soon as possible, because if you delay, that, might, that landing spot might uh, go out of reach. And an, an imperfect spot can be better than a better one that you may or may not be able to reach. So that's exactly what we talked about before. Stretching eliminates option if you come up short. Yep. And then like we've talked about before, if possible, you can be a thousand feet above your landing point. Of course, remember you want to land into the wind. And just like you practice for the same reasons. Now, of course, in practice, you might like if this happens to you, you might depending on where the airport is, you might have to do like a long final or some, some other sort of maneuvering. It just, you know, do what you need to do. But if you have options, you can consider breaking it down into the steps we talked about before. When you do practice it, please don't aim for the threshold of the runway. Um, aim farther down to give yourself some margin so that you don't land short. Okay, all right. Now, if you if you say, for example, you lose your altitude, your engine right over the airport. Well, 
there are many ways, but one suggested way is to do a, like a spiral over the airport because you want to stay close to the airport. You don't want to go far away and then you realize, oh, now I'm too far. Now I can't even make it back. So a spiraling descent, not an emergency descent, but a spiral descent at best glide at a shallower bank is, is usually a, a good way to do it. The question is, though, how many turns do you do? Because if you don't do enough, you'll end up too high. If you do too many, you're going to end up at the down at the down with at 400 feet AGL, for example, and that might be too low. <clears throat> so how many turns do you do if you're going to spiral over the airport? Well, practice. See what it does. And again, that's part of the reason we're doing this flight cleaning. Do one of the spirals at 30 degrees of bank or something at best glide. And notice how much altitude the plane loses at every turn. If you know this number, you can better make an informed decision. Well, now I'm I'm at four he, 1,400 AGL. Do I have space for, for another turn or not? If not, well, yeah, you might start the downwind to final turn higher than you would like, but, you know, it's only 400 feet. You can put down flaps earlier. You can do a forward slip. You'll probably make it. But if you, if you are at 1,400 feet and you do another turn and you end up at 600 feet, then it might be too low. So practice that, see how much altitude the plane loses. And of course, you know, it depends on the plane. Part idle, 20 degrees of bank, you can do it at 30 as well, but well, ma maximum 20, because that's usually good for gliding. That, that's, what, that's what we say here. So yeah, ma uh, maximum 20 is, is, is a good line. Best glide configuration, flaps, gear, well, you don't really have much choice for the gear in CAP, but anyway, flaps, gear, best glide, Glide speed as well. We talk about the the prop. It's best to not touch the prop if you don't absolutely need to. Even if this happens to you for real, if you're gonna make it to the runway without touching the prop, well, don't do it. Why? Because if you don't do a perfect job and you're gonna la land just short, well, maybe you're Pulling back the prop can be like a, an extra tool in your toolbox, actually maybe the only one, to extend your glide just a little bit. This also kind of goes in the glider world, for those familiar. It's one of the reasons gliders land with air brakes on, because if they're going to come up short, well, they don't have an engine, and they don't want to land short, so it's a tool that they can use. I'm going to I'm going to do all my calculations with air brakes on, but if I'm going to kind of come up short, I'm going to pull my brakes down and extend my glide. It's a similar thing here. It's not as dramatic, of course, but it's a similar thing here. So, aircraft positions. Again, it depends on your situation, how you're going to end up. One situation is that you might find yourself like into the wind, over the numbers. That's good. sort of referred to sometimes as the high key position. And that's where you can start doing like your, your turns. The other uh, situation is downwind above the numbers. And in that case, you sort of have, have to turn around. There's all these sort of situations where you might find yourself in, use your best judgment, but if you know how much altitude the plane needs to descend at every turn, you can make a better informed decision. Again, we try to land into the wind. But of course, if this happens to you for real and you have to land with a tailwind, please you know, do what you need to, but be absolutely sure that you can make it and have a, a backup plan. All right, so... Here's a question. Let's say that you determine that your descent number is 800 feet. So one circle takes 800 feet. And you're now you're done with the windy numbers at 1400 feet, AGO. What do you do? Maybe a slip or maybe some S turns. Yep, all good idea. So, Probably the best situation, the best decision here is to not make another turn. And by turn, I mean uh, uh, 360. Just go on the downwind, start your base fine and all that. But you know you have altitude to lose. And through practice, you know how to do that. You know, like S turns on the final or uh, forward slip uh, and so on. If you did not know that the plane needs 800 feet, you might be tempted to do another turn. And that's why it's a good, good to have the number in mind. 
If you do make this turn, you're going to find yourself at 600 feet AGL downwind of Ibn Abbas. Is that possible to make? Maybe, but maybe not. Uh, of course, you know, we, we can play different scenarios, like what about a little higher, what about a little lower, in any case. Now, and, and of course, if you find yourself in this situation, when you're done with the BIMD numbers, um, yeah, this is, I'm sorry, I didn't phrase it right. This is the, the, the situation we are talking about here. This is done with uh, uh, BIMD numbers. If you find yourself, what I meant to say is, what I, if you find yourself over the runway on downwind, like consider that you, you might have to do a little teardrop. Basically, just have a plan of the maneuvering that you might want to do. And based on practice, you might have an understanding of how much altitude that, that's going to cost. And please don't aim to land on the threshold. I think a third of the way down is good. Gives you use some margin on on the short side, so you're not going to land short, and it still gives you plenty of runway. Of course, remember 70-1. We practice this at 5,000 feet of runway or 3,000 with a cap instructor pilot on board. But even with 3,000 feet of runway, that still gives you plenty of margin. Of course, still use your judgment, still do your pre-fly planning, your calculations. But what I'm basically I'm trying to say here, if you try to aim for the threshold, you're you don't have any margin on the short side. Of course, if you practice, like when we practice this um, and for the flight cleaning, you have the option of go around and please use it if it's not, if the safe outcome is, is in doubt. But if this happens to you for real, well, if you aim farther than the runway, you just give yourself more margin. Now, that's a good thing. Okay, practice this regularly, avoid extending downwind. This may or may not work. The problem is it's hard to judge your glide towards the runway when you're going downwind. Or basically the spot method doesn't work unless you're going towards that spot. So if you extend too much, well, that, 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 might, that might be too far. It takes longer and more accurate to get back than you expect. You can also, also have this in mind with flaps because when you're going in base, well, the runway doesn't move much up or down your windshield because you're not going closer or farther away from it. Actually, the, uh, the runway is not even, even on your windshield, it's on your window. What I meant to say is like, you can't use the spot method. So don't be too eager to put down flaps unless you're, up, you're sure that, that you're too high. When you're in final, you can make better judgments and you can always do any of the things we said before here, esterns, slips and so on. And, you know, use your other tools basically everything we talked about. One other tool that we don't usually talk about is reducing speed. If you reduce speed, you increase the angle of attack for the same glide path, and that gives you more induced drag. So that's another way to get down, and in some planes, you get down fast. The key is you sort of have to make sure you recover fast enough that, that uh, I'm sorry, uh, high enough that you don't just slam into the ground. So... If you're going to reduce your speed to increase your uh, descent, that's great. But you then at some point have to drop the nose to regain some energy so that you have enough energy to flare. So use that with caution, but it's a great tool for some planes to, to really descend. It, it really helps. Of course, flaps, airstern, slips, all that. That's exactly what I said before. Watch your airspeed. You need to have some energy left to arrest the descent so you can flare and land. Okay, so energy failure is more, uh, I, I, wouldn't I don't know, but more likely, but, the, well, actually, yeah, so this statement implies that the energy failure causes about the engine. It's not, for example, running out of fuel, of course, you know, do your pre-flight planning. But there's a high chance that an energy failure will give you some sort of trouble in takeoff and climb because it hasn't proven itself yet. Maybe it doesn't want to fly that day. Well, if you're cruising, you know, you, it has already be, been running so far. So, one thing that you can do, again, it, it, it's, a, it's a consideration. And until you reach a safe altitude, a safe altitude, what is that? It's an altitude that you have a, a good amount of confidence that you can make it back to the airport, for example, or to some other good landing spot. So, until a safe altitude, climb at an altitude, um, at that airspeed, that's a typo, uh, no, gain altitude, that's not a type, I just can't read. Okay, so climb at a rate 
that is faster, basically gives you altitude faster and helps you stay close to the airport. In practical terms, if you fly at VY, it gives you more altitude faster and it keeps you closer to the airport than if you climb at, say, 100 knots. So have a good discipline on your climb out to maintain good speed because it helps you have more options later if you do lose your engine. You can consider doing a lap in the pattern before departing, especially if you're going to pick up a plane after maintenance or I don't know if it's been sitting down for a while. Just just do that. You can also, if you have, if, if, if you really have doubts, in which case, you, you know, take that into account of the ORM, talk to your flight release officer. But anyway, another tool is just to do a spiral climb over the airport. You uh, have enough runway. You can start your roll at the beginning of the runway, the, the departure end. Um, you know, sometimes we get offered intersection departures and, you know, if that means that you have 10,000 feet of runway ahead of you, you know, that, that might be fine because you can still come back to land. But basically, runway that's behind you is of no use. Also, you know, runway behind you and fuel on the ground, the two useless things. We want to have runway in front of us, not behind us. And of course, know what airports are close by. And, you know, if you're going to arrive at an airport, don't give up altitude sooner than you need to. Re really, that that's what that means. Don't try to land at 5,000 feet, AGL, but don't give up altitude before it's time. You still have to enter the traffic pattern, uh, traffic pattern altitude and all that, but just have in mind. So we actually had in CEP in Fresno uh, a plane that lost its engine. And thankfully it was able to come back. This is sort of, this is where it left. So it took off from left to right in this picture, made a slight right turn, departed, lost the engine, came back and made it. And that was great. That was, um, it actually, so, so the pilot did a great job here uh, in both deciding and flying. Why? Well, if we look at the numbers, so the engine went out at, you know, these are approximate, of course. Um, the engine went out about 2,500 feet MSL, airport elevation is 326. That's about 2,100 AGL. The distance to the runway was about three miles. So if we look at the numbers, the eight to one glide ratio, uh, that would require 2,000 feet to make it back three miles. So what happened in this case was there was some really good flying involved. So the pilot did a great job, but also, and we're actually not sure, but anyway, that goes into more details. Like, remember, that goes back into the previous discussion. You don't have to land necessarily on the, on the runway if you cannot make it. On the runway environment is also safer than on the house. Maybe just as safe as on the runway if you land on the on a taxiway that is clear of, of airplanes, of course. So in this case, that, that helped because there's a long overrun at that particular airport. So these are sort of the math involved. The other way to look at it is at 2,100 feet AGL, the plane could glide 3.3 miles. You know, again, zero wind, perfect flying and so on. Yeah, I think... Does anybody George, have any comments? Do, you know what the, do we know what the wind was on that day? I don't. Uh, I, I don't remember I do. what the wind was. I okay. do, and we were fortunate that a half hour after we landed, they turned the runways around, so we had to take off on 1-1. One, one. The winds weren't real strong. They were picking up. They were less than 10. But the fact that they had turned around, and we were able to take off on 1-1 one, one and head south before we headed back to Concord is what made the runway possible. Thank you. Yep. That answer. I think so. Yeah. Any other questions? Thanks, John. Any other questions? I just want to thank you for putting this together. Oh, we're not done. We we uh, we oh, have okay. a few more slides, mostly on logistics. I, I'm I'm just talking about questions about the power off. Ah. Okay. okay. Nothing heard. And there's also oh. so uh, yeah. 
Go ahead. Yeah, Andrew, uh, this is kind of more going towards the um, the fires discussion we had before. Um, has there been any thought about putting containment bags in aircraft, or is that already a thing? I know that's something in the airlines we're seeing more and more. Um, for you know, everybody's carrying a, some sort of electronic device, lithium ion batteries, whatever, laptops, iPads, and um, you know, there's a threat there with that catching on fire more than aircraft equipment. So I was just wondering if that was something that's in consideration. That is a great point. I'm not aware of it being a consideration, but we, but we can make it so. Of course, I don't. Can you email me afterwards, like an example of such a bag? Is that easy? Yeah, yeah, that's and that's not a problem. I think they sell them in sporties um, with some oven mitts too. George, they they make. A, it's interesting because there's bags that we use with drones for the extra batteries, which they consider to be a hazardous material. But the battery in the drone is not a hazardous material. The same thing with your iPad or your phone. It's hazardous, but when you're using your phone or iPad, you're not going to put it in a bag. It's only the extra batteries like for your camera or for a drone or something through a lithium that you would worry about getting too hot. Yeah, but, but you can have a bag in the plane so that if your iPad does get uh, catch a fire, you can then put it in the bag. That, that, that was my understanding before. Ah, okay, that would be a yeah. good but Yeah, that's yeah. correct. We're, we're seeing it in the airlines, and I was just curious if that's something that's working its way to GA as well. Well, we haven't thought of it, but that's a great comment. So I, yeah, l uh, let's talk about it later. It depends on the cost and all that, but but maybe. Yeah, I've also suggested that, like, I carry a, a, a head bag. It's a bag that uh, goes over your head, and then there's this mouthpiece that has a filter on it to, so that if there is a fire and smoke, not only does it help you breathe, but if you put the, your head against the window, it, it, you know, makes it so there's no smoke between your eyes and the and the windshield, too. So it fits over your it, it, it it's like a soda can size, and the it fits over your head, and then you bite the end of it, and you can breathe through that filter. That that's a good idea too. So, yeah. So let's look at options later, and, and we'll see. It depends on the cost and the weight and so on. But these are all great ideas because you're right. Actually, iPads and devices are prone to this thing. Okay. So no flap landings. Also suggest you practice this if you haven't as part of this clinic. We talked about abnormal procedure. Asymmetrical flap failure is not really, it's unlikely an emergency. What that means is that both flaps are in the same position, they just don't work anymore. Uh, but an asymmetrical flap failure could or is an emergency because then you have the two wings and they're, they're giving you a different lift. Now, can that happen? Well, it's really unlikely to happen because like in a G1000, 182, or actually all 182s and 172s that have electrical flaps, they have one flap motor exactly for that reason. But, you know, th that motor is connected through pulleys or who knows what can happen. It's really unlikely, but it could happen. So practice partial or no flap landings on your flight and refer to your POH for your approach speed. So like landing without flaps, the POH for G1182 suggests pretty much 10 knots faster than with, with fl flaps. If you're going to land without electricity, another something else that I, I suggest you do, it's in the syllabus, pretend that you have no electricity. So you've lost your alternator and you are a little far from the airport, so you run dry the standby battery as well. So dim the PFD, don't use flaps, and just fly with your standbys. You're basically landing a plane without any electrical power. Because, yeah, the, the flaps are not only going to fail, the flap motor fails. It's also if you lose electrical power. Unusual attitude recovery. So we do this in Form 5s, but you might, if you find yourself in IMC where you weren't expecting, well, how do you know? that you're entering an unusual attitude. It could be the sound, the wind, like the wind noise. It could be, of course, your airspeed, um, your your engine instruments, like your at attitude reference, whatever that is, if it's a PFT or, or a round dial, your airspeed. There's all these clues that can get, tell you that you're in an unusual attitude. First, determine if it's nose up or nose down. You might take an extra second to determine that, because if you make the wrong choice, that's worse. So know for sure that if your nose up or nose down, go to your airspeed indicator first. That will give you um, sort of your first clue. Does anybody know why? And 
that suggestion is there to go to your airspeed indicator first. Why why are you not going to look at your attitude first? You're still going to look at it, but not first necessarily. Attitude might be tumbled. It might tumble exactly. This is all all mechanical ones are are prone to that. This is what a G1000 nose down looks like. It gives you your chevrons. It actually simplifies the PFT. It removes some things from the PFT just to make your job easier. It gives you chevrons like go up. Power to idle. So in this nose down situation, power to idle. You don't want more speed. You already have plenty of speed, more likely. Level the wings and pull the nose up gently because you probably have a lot of speed already. Gently pull the nose up. So if you do this in a round dial where the attitude indicator has tumbled, how do you know the, the, that you're um, you've pulled up enough and now the nose is level. Well, you can use your altimeter, you can use your VSI. The moment your VSI switches its trend or your altimeter stops moving, well, that, that's probably level or zero pitch or close to that. If your nose up, that's what it looks like. G1000 is going to tell you go down with these nice chevrons. Out power, push your nose down, level the wings. Now, in, in practice, you uh, like the first thing is power. Notice in both cases. And then the, the order changes. Between, so like when you go uh, nose down, we first level the wings and then pull the nose up. The reason is that if you pull the nose up without leveling the wings, you might be in a graveyard spiral. So you're not actually going to raise the nose. You're just going to tighten the turn. Now in practice, you, uh, I, uh, sorry, and then for nose up, yeah, you can, you can it's the opposite. Push your nose down away from stall and level the wings. In practice, you can sort of do them at the same time. Okay, prioritize, prior, uh, stabilize the aircraft and then level your altitude. And then a second priority is to go back to your previous altitude or heading. And of course, get yourself out of I, I, IMC. So we talked about the tumbling. Landing without elevator control. You know, we're not going to practice that, of course, because it has a high risk when you're actually going to do it. But this is what the uh, POH for G1182 says. You basically control, uh, they want you to do a 80 knot descent using your throttle and trim. You can practice this at altitude. See how easy it is to establish an 80 knot descent using only the throttle and the elevator trim. And once you establish that, do not change the trim setting. Control the glide angle by adjusting power. So that's something you can practice at altitude. And then during the landing flare, well, the nose might come down. That's, yeah, that that's something that can happen. But at least you can be landing safely, e even though the nose wheel might be touching down in this case. But anyway, that's what the POH has to say. How, so if you're flying, this is landing with flat tires. If you're flying, how do you know you have a flat tire? Anybody? Look out the window. Look out the window. That's one of your main gears. Yeah. And actually the other one, the nose wheel. Well, that's kind of hard. You might have an indication like on your takeoff roll when you pulled up, you might have heard a bang or, or, or the tower might have told you maybe, but there's a good chance that you might not even know that you have a flood nose wheel. If you have a flat main tire, well, touch on the good main tire first. And then when the bad one touches down, well, try to maintain direction control. The plane is going to want to turn towards the bad tire. When you land with a flat nose tire, well, touch on mains, of course, and then try to hold up the nose wheel as long as you can. And then when the nose wheel does, does touch down, maintain full up elevator because you're going to try to uh, relieve from nose wheel from weight as much as you can, but then the plane is going to stop. Okay, so wrapping up here, the logistics. F finding an instructor. You can use the instructor list in PCR mobile tools. That only keeps you cap instructor pilots. If you want to um, find non cap instructor pilots that are authorized for this flight cleaning, uh, you can ask your group that's handled at the group level. If there are any, there, there might not be any. Uh, remember that somebody who's an instructor 
for this clinic does not mean that they're, they're a cap instructor pilot. So if you're going to uh, practice a power of landing, the 70-1 limit is 5,000 feet because it only comes down to 3,000 if you have a cap instructor pilot. It has a very specific meaning. So check pilots or instructor pilots button. You can also ask your group. Make sure the instructor pilot is participating in the flight clinic, or I mean they're, they're willing to fly this. Uh, so there's flexibility in the topics. We talked about many things, and there's a syllabus you can also refer to. You don't have to do everything. Just pick the ones that are more interesting to you, that you haven't done in a while, and come up with a plan so that you're efficient. You can practice more things. Remember, uh, this currently, the guideline is 1.5 hobs, no more. That might change depending on funding. The mission runs until the end of June, but please don't let it until the end of June. Fly early. If you fly early, we might have enough funds so that you fly again before the mission closes. Discuss options. Yep. Make sure everybody knows what is going to happen. Even to the details. I'm going to do a power of landing with this degree of bank to this airspeed. Yeah, 1 to 1.5 hobs. Don't create an emergency while practicing emergencies. We talked about some ways to not doing that in this flight cleaning, but part of that is also good CRM and make sure you have a good plan with your with your instructor. Do not do anything that you don't feel comfortable. It, either member can call and knock it off. Uh, part of this is also, you know, practice this at enough altitude, satisfying the regulations for the power off on takeoff 2,000 feet on, uh, on completion, but you know, you might want to increase that if you don't feel comfortable, that, that, that's perfectly fine. Or you might not fly a maneuver that you don't feel comfortable with.